So uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming along to uh, what we hope will be an action-packed session for you, covering uh, Azure Batch. And in particular, the, uh, we've really had some exciting uh, new announcements in the last couple of days, some really sort of hopefully valuable key cap major capabilities that we've added to the platform. So we're going to spend some time you know, digging into those. My name's Mark Scurrell. I'm a program manager in the Azure Compute Book Group uh, based over in uh, Redmond, just across the lake. Uh, Co-presenting with me today and uh, fixing up his laptop is uh, Karan Bata, also a program manager in the Azure Compute Group and about three doors down from me at, uh, at work. So we're going to uh, co-host this, as I say. Um, I'll, I'll do work on the first half, uh, roughly. Uh, I'll try not to go long, Karan. And uh, Karan will be uh, taking the last 30 minutes or so. Uh, this is going to be a really tightly packed session. So uh, we'll definitely uh, stick around at the end and uh, if there's any questions. And then also, we've got a couple of uh, special guests that are coming up and uh, join us on the stage. So that'll be cool. All right, so I just wanted to get started with uh, just a brief overview of, of Batch and really sort of what our goals were and sort of what problems we're sort of trying to solve uh, with Batch. And really, it was all about you know, making it easy and efficient for you to run could be your algorithms, could be your applications, be able to run them at scale in Azure. Now, some of these uh, applications or algorithms you could have been running uh, on premises. You might have been running on them on workstations, desktops. You know, perhaps you had on-premise HPC cluster you were running them on, or perhaps they're um, you know new new applications or, or algorithms. But we want to make it easy for you to. Uh, deploy those, run them, and uh, do that easily and efficiently. And it always amazes me whenever I talk to customers, and this is a real set of, uh, or a real list of uh, use cases, for, you know, for what, what uses are, is Batch uh, put to. And uh, there's sort of really a split between uh, more, maybe more traditional HPC engineering scientific applications, like, you know, fluid dynamics, uh, finite elements analysis, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe genomics and so on, your traditional HPC workloads. And then we see a lot of, you know, basically just massively parallel scale-out workloads as well. Um, so things like transcoding, transcoding, we're going to hear about rendering, testing, and, and so on. So all these uh, workloads have a pretty similar and same set of characteristics. And it sort of starts off, you know, you've got your application or algorithms, uh, and you need some... Um, some compute resource on which to run them. So we can get some, get some VMs. And then you need those, th those applications or algorithms installed on the VMs. I get too far away from here. And then we sort of we come to the need for job scheduling, the ability to actually get work done on those VMs. So we, you know, normally there's uh, some sort of queue, the set of tasks that you want to run on those VMs in the queue, and then the job scheduler uh, you need a mechanism to effectively assign those to the free VM, uh, get them executed. The scheduler will wait till the VM becomes free and do the next one and, and so on. Storage is basically always there. Um, basically, we see probably mainly Azure storage, Azure storage blobs, uh, file shares sometimes used, sometimes databases. Um, but there's so, some sort of persistent storage there. Uh, and the nodes are normally sort of treated as sort of ephemeral. They can sort of come and go. They scale up, scale down, and so on. But sort of the key characteristic, obviously, sort of about the batch processing workload is the, is the tasks that are run. They're sort of discrete tasks. They start, they normally read some input. Might be on the VM, might be from the file share. So read the input, do some processing. Could be 30 seconds, could be three minutes, could be nine hours. Uh, produce the output, and then that task's finished, and then maybe there's another task that'll run on that VM. So sometimes these tasks uh, need to communicate as well. Often they don't, but sometimes they do, especially in the uh, scientific workloads, the finite elements analysis and so on. So again, you're going to need a system, some sort of capability that caters for that connectivity as well. So where does Batch fit in, fit in the stack? And if we start with the infrastructure, We've got the hardware, and that's exposed via the VMs and all the VM sizes. And we've got a very, very ex rapidly expanding range of VM sizes in Azure, from sort of commodity hardware all the way up to you know, GPU and HPC class hardware. And obviously, you know, there's workloads where maybe you've got an on-premises job scheduler. 
uh, you've got some on-premises software and you basically just want to lift and shift that and, and bring that into Azure and use, basically use our infrastructure offering. And that's, that's fine. But for the certainly new applications, if you want to, if it's really you're sort of starting from scratch or you sort of need more um, ease of use, maybe more scale and so on, that's really where Azure Batch comes in, being that higher level platform service. So really sort of focusing on the ability to easily configure, manage, uh, monitor the health of large numbers of VMs, and then provide the job scheduling for you, get that work done on those VMs. So that's enough of the slides. Let's uh, switch over to the demo. And uh, I think sort of the best way to uh, sort of is to see, what, see, find out a bit more about Batch is to see it in, in action. So the first thing I'm going to do, uh, and we're going to do this a few between Karan and I, we'll do this sort of a few ways so you can see the various ways that you can use Azure Batch. I'm going to start off with a concept of a pool, and I'm going to create a pool using uh, this JSON template. And this is a sort of relatively new capability we have in preview for the Azure CLI. So the first concept is a pool. And for a pool, really, it's just the grouping, grouping of VMs. Um, so zero, actually zero or more VMs. So we can see from the pool definition here, we have an ID. Uh, we're going to give it a pool ID. And this is a template, so we can supply parameters to this template. We're going to give it an ID. There's a virtual machine configuration. We're going to create some, some VMs. And uh, if we scroll up here, we can see it's going to be uh, some Ubuntu VMs. We've got the VM size, standard D3, V2, and it's four core machine. And then the uh, target dedicated. This is the number of nodes or the number of VMs that we're going to want in that pool that we sort of set. We set here, and then Batch will go and get, fetch those VMs. Other configuration related to auto scale, uh, how many tasks can be scheduled at any one time on the node. And then in this case, so I'm sort of using as a canonical example FFmpeg. We'll just do some simple uh, transcoding, video transcoding. Uh, in this case, we're on, we're on Linux, so I'm going to use apt and apt gets to get uh, FFmpeg. And that's sort of effectively schematized here in the template. So I've got the command line, uh, Azure CLI here. So I can um, uh, create this pool. It's just a uh, easy batch pool create. We've got a template, and the template is pool ffmpeg.json. So we're going to select a VM count. This is a template. I've defined at the top of the template some parameters. So uh, I'm going to say 20, and we'll just call it ffmpeg. Uh, this is a preview feature, and that's been submitted. That was good, quick, nice and quick. So hopefully that's a good sign for the network. So let me go to the Azure portal. So this is the Azure portal. Uh, I'm in a batch account here. Uh, this is a batch account in uh, US Central. And if I scroll, we've got some summary information here. Scroll down for pools. <clears throat> and so we'll see how the network is. This was a little slow earlier on. We should get the list of pools. I had one pool I'd already created, and we should get this pool that's been created here. Uh, and you'll see. There we go. So FFmpeg, uh, it's sitting here, no calls at the moment, and it's in a resizing state. If we select that, again, we can sort of see the summary information. It's Ubuntu, the VM size, it's resizing, and we haven't got any VMs yet. So let's keep that here. And while that's allocating, uh, we'll go back to our templates. So I sort of introduced the concept of a pool, what sort of uh, properties it has, how you configure it. And, uh, it's pretty quick to create that. Uh, now let's have a look at the job and actually get some, get some work done. So this is the template for a job, uh, similar to a pool. You've got a, you obviously, you've got an ID. There's some constraints. This is where some of the sort of more sophisticated features come in for our job scheduling. You can set here, this is the max time for a, a job. How many times do, do uh, tasks, do we retry tasks before failing? And a job's always assigned to a pool. You know, which set of resources do you want the work run on? So the, sort of the key piece of uh, uh, configuration for a task is the command line. And batch, and batch tasks are, are simply the, sort of the main unit of execution. is simply the command line. So here, we're, just, we're running ffmpeg with the input, um, an input file, and writing an output file, uh, you know, a .mp4. And that, what this task is going to do is it's going to consume, it's going to copy in from blob storage an input file, 
And then once the task has complete, and we can see here on the upload de details, if the task is successful, then it's going to write back to a storage account for us the, the output file. Now, I think in the storage account or container that I've got, there's about 50 uh, files. So we need 50 tasks for that. So that's all wrapped up in this uh, template with a task factory. And as, uh, we have different ones of the different styles of these, and this is a task per file. So we should get 50 tasks generated for, for this. Um, so let's see that. If we see on the right here, we can see the VMs are coming up. I've got 20 already. Uh, they've actually started. This is pretty good. And now they're actually waiting for start task. What this is doing, this is actually doing the apt get on FFmpeg and, and uh, getting that on the VM. So you should actually see, if you keep an eye on the right-hand side, that going uh, idle, which is uh, gray fairly shortly. So that's our template. Let me go back to our uh, command line. And we'll do an easy batch job, create this time. Template job. And OK, so our pool here was simply FFmpeg. We'll go. Uh, JDemo. And this should, so what this will do is inspect, I'll actually show you in a second, this will inspect a storage con container. There's 50 files in there, and it's going to create a task per, yeah, a task per um, file. Actually, let me do, let me just quickly show you that while we're waiting. Um, so here we've got blob containers. Uh, these are in thing called file groups. So there's a file group prefix, and here's the input. So we can see, actually, I've got a bunch of our, the famous uh, Tuesdays with Corey's videos that are, that are posted that we're going to uh, transcode. So that's there. When, they, when those are done, we've got our an output container. Actually, I've still got those there. So let me, I can do a select all in page and, and delete those before that starts. This is taking a little time to, to submit. Uh, all right. Um, so just while that's going, as we see back here, so these are still waiting for start task. Uh, this is actually submitted. Uh, took a little longer. Uh, so the job submitted, we should have some tasks. So let me go back, and here we've got under, right underneath pools, we've got jobs, and then we've got J demo. So here you can see we've got all our tasks. They're all sitting there active. You know, we've got some preset searches here, running tasks, queued, completed, and, and so on. Um, and we can see sort of the tasks here. Now, let me go sort of finally go back to see if we're, we're lucky. And uh, uh, they're, they're actually absolutely uh, they're executing. Uh, so if we go to the output here as well, no data yet. All right, so um, let me see while that's going. I think maybe what we'll do is I'll, I'll let that go, and then because uh, I don't want to run long, and uh, we'll come back to that on the, in the, in the next demo. So, but then hopefully that sort of showed you, that demonstrated sort of the main concepts of pools and, and jobs, and shown how to create them pretty easily, no code required with the, with the templates. So in terms of the value, we sort of often talked, you know, so the customers that is, you know, used Batch for all the particular workloads, you know, what's the main value that you get out of using you know, Azure and then with an Azure Batch? And it sort of really comes down to sort of the elasticity, you know, being efficient, the scale, and sort of cost effectiveness. Just the fact that uh, you know, you can, you've got work to do, you want to run your jobs on demand, you can do that, and you can get the capacity you need to run those jobs on demand. The fact that you can sort of scale according to load. You know, you've get, got this capacity when you need it, and you can scale it according to the load and pay by the minute. Uh, and then when it comes to scale, you know, we see a vast range from, of uh, workloads that require anything from you know, maybe uh, tens, 10, 20 VMs, all the way up to you know, tens of thousands of uh, VMs. And then batch itself, you know, we aim to be cost effective. There is no charge for batch itself. Uh, you pay for the underlying resources that are, that are used, that's mainly the compute, but also any you know, storage, networking, and, and so on. 
So this is just one example, actually, of the elasticity. This is a real workload, uh, and the customer is using auto scale. And during the week, you can see sort of the spikes, how it's scaling up and down according to the, the load and the jobs that have been submitted by the users. And then the, the troughs there, uh, basically the weekend. And they're using the batch auto scale capability to sort of manage all this for them, and it just scales down automatically when there's no, no load. So just very quickly sort of wanted to uh, cover, you know, like where are we going with the batch serve? Where did we start and where are we going? I mean, Azure Batch, you know, we've probably been around about a couple of years now. And really sort of where we initially focused was the development platform and being able to um, allow customers to create, you know, SaaS offerings, to be able to create, you know, client apps that can leverage uh, Azure and, and number, large numbers of VMs to, you know, perform, you know, large scale workloads. And what we're doing really now is sort of trying to like, make batch and make these capabilities available to an expanded audience. And you know, one set of users, for example, there would be like data scientists and researchers and so on, who maybe have got their application, they've got their simulation or algorithm, and they need somewhere to run it. And we you know, want batch, they can come to batch and be able to use it you know, without writing any, any code. Recently, we just released a plugin for RStudio, and this is an example of where we're providing plugins for, for sort of key clients and providing plugins directly into the um, uh, client applications so that that user, using the tool of choice, can, um, uh, can again, use Batch really, really easily and within the, a familiar context. And then we announced uh, last couple of days our rendering service and also our AI tra training service as well for workload-specific services. So with that, I want to invite uh, Tom up. Tom's from uh, Milliman, and uh, he's a great example of a customer who's used Azure Batch to create a SaaS offering. So welcome, Tom. Thanks, Mark. Um, hi, everyone. So yeah, I'll just give you a quick introduction to Milliman. I expect none of you have heard of us before now. Um, we're a global leader in the provision of actuarial risk management solutions. Um, we advise 80% of the world's leading insurers, and we have offices all around the world. I actually work in London. Um, my, actually Southampton, but London may as well be Southampton. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, we have our headquarters here in Seattle, so I'm here quite a bit working closely with Mark and team. Um, our, our kind of computational, tra computational transformation is a bit like what Mark was saying earlier. You know, we, we had a desktop platform back in the 90s. Your computer was powerful enough, it could run everything you needed. Then your computer needed more cores, so you went to a server. Um, and then to a grid on-premise, so we were a user of Microsoft HPC on-premise. Um, and then you ran out of cores on-prem and you need to go to the cloud because there's infinite amounts of cores in the cloud, right? We'll see that later, actually. Um, but, and then we built our own solution on top of cloud services, and um, now we're in, inside of Batch, running inside of Batch because of the value it adds on top. And we'll go through, really what I'm here to show you today is the transition we went through on Batch and how um, all the value that Batch has has come to our clients. Um, we had a really successful platform before then, though. Um, we've got 138 million core hours under our belt so far. Well, that's between 2013 and 2016, so this year doesn't count, and our first couple of years doesn't count either. Um, and we've seen loads of our customers move their workload to the cloud, so a 383% increase in consumption is a pretty good hockey stick level of consumption we're seeing uptake from our customers. So why, who are our customers and why do they need... Um, this amount of comp computation. So they, life insurers do something called stochastic modeling, and I won't go into the details of that, but in reality, it helps them predict uncertainty. Um, there are two types of jobs that we will run in our compute platform. One is stochastic simulations. So think of a job as just a, as a directed acyclic graph of tasks. So in a stochastic model, you have lots of jobs that have lots of scenarios within them, and then a merge task at the end that brings all of that data together. In a nested stochastic job, as the, as, the, as the name suggests, you have stochastic simulations running inside of stochastic simulations. So all that really means for us is our DAGs are bigger. We have more nesting in the, in the DAG and we have more tasks. In the example I'll show you later, and why we need this amount of scale, you, you'll, you'll kind of get it then, I think, but um, you, can only you can only parallelize each time sequence, right? So if you look at this graph here, the first the first pivot out, where we have all of these inner, inner jobs, if you like, are, um, they can all be parallelized completely. But they will take as long as the model takes to run. So you have an hour runtime. Your first pivot will take an hour. 
So if you have 10 pivots, it will take 10 hours to run the entire job. Um, what we also want to do is scale up and down as we run these inner and outer loops. So moving to batch, this is kind of the first, other than going bigger, which we'll get to at the end, we wanted um, the customer to just click a button on the desktop and the job start. So this is an example of that. This is an 1,000 task job. So we are able to get 90% um, of the VMs on in, in four minutes. I say we batch got the VMs on in four minutes. And then all of the tasks were running after 11 minutes, which is 85% quicker than our existing solution. So that's a big win for our customers. Now there's no emotional attachment to clicking the run button. They click run and it runs, which has been really well received. Um, increased utilization. We actually have another product that kind of uses our compute platform as well as our desktop product, which is a kind of calculation orchestration engine. It's called Integrate. And um, it submits series of jobs. So in this, what you're seeing here is at the beginning, it sends a few calibration jobs in that run a small amount of work. Then we run a bunch of stuff. More calculations happen outside. And then, you know, so the series of jobs arrive. Um, prior to batch, all those white areas in between the peaks would have been still calls running. So that would have been cost a customer would have had to pay. Um, now we're achieving around 87% utilization. Well, this example here is 80% utilization. Um, and we use 90,000 cores, um, which is 40, just under 50% better than our previous solution. So that's a big cost saving to our customers. Because we can go bigger now, because we can scale up and down through those troughs, we can also run your job faster. So this is an example of us running um, exactly the same job on 30,000 cores and 8,000 cores. Uh, it was 50% quicker on 30,000 cores and only 20% more expensive. Now, all things being equal, you'd ex you can't get linear scale, right? It costs money to turn the computers on, it costs money to turn the computers off. But 150 pounds extra per human hour saved is actually a big win. So you've got these expensive actuarial resources sat there waiting for their answer, and they're getting their answer 10 hours quicker than they did before, which is of huge value to our clients, and it's for an extra $1,500 is, is kind of a bargain. And then the last point, so that back to this nested stochastic job. So this is an example of a nested stochastic job running up to 150,000 cores. So it starts out its outer loop. We have 150 outer loops. Um, it then gets to the point where it needs to pivot and create its, create its inner, inner scenarios. And that then scales all the way up to 150,000 cores, which takes about the same amount of time as it does to turn 1,000 cores on, which is pretty incredible, I think. Um, it'll then run for a period of time. And obviously, the cores come. There's a tail of cores coming on at the end. And as the... And as they complete, we turn the cores off. We continue on the inner loop, get to the next pivot point, and scale back up again. So in this example, we had a total of 300,000 tasks running. The job took around 50, um, I think the job took around an hour or so. Yep. And, um, and uh, yeah, it, was, um, it worked. And it was, it was pretty awesome to see that level of scale. So I'll um, hand you back to Mark, and he'll take you through the That's rest. That's great. Thanks very much, Tom. No yeah, I mean, that was a fantastic result that we got there, and it's been a yeah, real pleasure. <laughs> Pretty incredible, especially even when you work on the team, as you say, you sort of get a little used to it, and you step back, and you think, wow, 150,000 cores, that's probably a pretty big room of uh, servers that you can literally just get in a, in a few minutes. So very cool. So just my last uh, segment here, uh, and I need to keep an eye on the time, is uh, I want to sort of talk about a, a really a, key capability that we announced just yesterday and think will be of absolutely huge value to uh, a large number of our uh, you know, Azure Batch customers. And that's low priority VMs, and it's currently in a public preview. So what are these low priority VMs? So what we're doing with them is we're making available you know, any surplus capacity that we have you know, in our data centers and our regions and so on. And we're making that available to you at a very, very significant discount. And that discount is up to 80% discount and uh, compared to sort of the full on-demand price. Uh, and that's a fixed price as well. If you go to the Azure Batch pricing page now, you'll actually see here's the list of VMs, here's the full price, and here's the, here's the low priority price. Sort of very simple to see what the cost is and how much you're, you're saving. Uh, this is supported uh, with all VM sizes that uh, Batch uh, currently supports, which is the vast majority, and in all regions. So given this is such a good deal and everything, but it's from surplus capacity, are there, you know, what's the gotchas or what's the trade-offs? So uh, I like to sort of think about this offer as effectively we've got the surplus capacity and we're allowing you to borrow it. 
And when you come to borrow this capacity, we'll give you it for a you know, very large discount. But sometimes we might not have some, some of that capacity you want to borrow, or potentially all of it. Um, or if you have that capacity, there are times when we would say, oh, actually, we need some of this back. So VMs could get preempted. So sort of the initial reaction to this is, oh, I don't know how I can use this. How can I use this if my VMs uh, you know, have the potential to go away or my uh, capacity that I want is, is being impacted? And really, sort of, you know, one of the main reasons we made this available through batch is that batch processing workloads and the characteristics of these are incredibly suitable to take advantage of this type of, of offer. So if you've got, you know, you've got your work, it's split up into lots of jobs or, or tasks. Um, now, if uh, they're sort of shorter tasks, if you've sort of got the flexibility on your job time, look, my job, hey, if it takes two hours to complete, if it takes five hours to complete, I'm happy with that. And there are lots of class of workloads that can do that. Then this is a great model. Uh, you know, if you've got that flexibility on your job execution time. If you've got 10-hour tasks and really it's pretty bad if at nine and a half hours that you get interrupted, then don't, you don't use low priority VMs, use the full price VMs. But there's a ton of um, you know, examples and scenarios where this offer is uh, going to be very, very suitable and really going to, in terms of value, it's going to allow you to get your work done either for lower cost or get your, that same amount of work done faster because you can throw more VMs at it, more resources at it, or actually be able to do a lot more work for, this, for the same price. Um, so just in terms of what this looks like, I'm literally just going to show you, I just because I just wanted to show you some code and the equivalent of the um, uh, template that I showed earlier on. Actually, this is the C Sharp uh, equivalent. And I'm going to, that comes back. I'm going to show you, um, did that break? OK. I'm going to continue that and create a pool, and then we'll just very quickly go back and have a look at the code. So just this effectively is the equivalent. I just want to show you the C-sharp code. So we're creating a pool. Here's the pool. Um, this time, we're going to do uh, Windows, Windows Server. And then obviously for this, for low priority, sort of these are the sort of two key lines to look at. So the pool can now consist of both dedicated nodes and low priority nodes. In this case, 20 dedicated, 80, 80 low priority. I've picked the same VM size and everything. And then I've got resource files here to actually copy FFmpeg on. I'm not using a package manager or anything. I'm pulling in FFmpeg uh, from blob storage, put it on the VM, and place it in a shared location. So to sort of this was uh, show you C Sharp, the equivalent of the uh, template earlier on, and then show you how the pool API has been changed now and how a pool can consist of both types of, of nodes. Let me just very quickly, if I go back to, if I go to IE here, look at the pools. So uh, this was using FFmpeg win. We can see here the dedicated nodes now is going up to 20. And now this is a new version of the API. It's been rolled out as we speak. Uh, it's going up to 80, 80 nodes. So and then that's summarized here, dedicated to 20, low priority up to 80. So that's just a, just a quick, quick run through uh, some, some C sharp code to create a pool and what the uh, pool API looks like for uh, low priority VMs. So uh, we saw that on the pools, the, the mixture. Then really sort of the nice thing with uh, batch today, you can scale up and down at any point explicitly or with auto scale the number of dedicated VMs. So with low priority, you can actually do the same. So dynamically, you can change the mix of the VMs in, in the pool. So um, the other thing that batch allows us to do is to really sort of make this type of compute offer much more easy to consume. I think we've done that with, in the pool case. But what about the case when we do take back the uh, VMs and, and VMs can be uh, preempted? So the first thing Batch will do is you know, determine, is there a running task on this VM? And if there is, and it does this already uh, with tasks, is it'll uh, say, OK, that's um, now gone. It can detect that, and it will requeue it for execution on another VM. And then the other sort of major value um, uh, bit of value that uh, the batch integration provides with low priority VMs is the ability to constantly seek to a target. 
So if some of the capacity is taken away and is preempted, batch will go off in the background and we'll look at other clusters in the region and so on, and we'll try and get replacement capacity for you to seek you back up to that target that you wanted. And you don't have to do anything. This just happens for you behind the scenes. So one great use case is with uh, Combinostics. They're an early stage company, super cool service that they're providing using batch for large scale image processing. This is image processing of MRIs, of brain scans. And they're looking for early si signs of various brain disorders um, and dementia and, and so on there. And really, when we've been working with them in our private preview, they sort of want to use low priority VMs basically for testing. During the dev cycle to test, and obviously it's a medical, you're doing image processing, they want need to run continually against a subset of, of data just to make sure they're not fundamentally breaking anything. And then this is a medical application. This has to be certified. It's very, very rigorous testing involved. So then before they release it, they have to do a full set of test passes on it. It takes thousands and thousands of core hours. And again, you know how long the job completes, they've got some flexibility there, and they can use low priority for this. So especially for an early stage company, they can you know, obviously value the, you know, a large reduction uh, in the dev test um, cost overhead. But really, I think, you know, almost like more interestingly as well is, it's going to allow them to iterate faster, because they can basically do this testing more often, catch issues more, more uh, earlier on. So I'm just going to wrap up then with um, various options for using the low priority VMs. And again, with this balancing, we sort of make it easy for you to trade off cost with predictability of job execution time. So, you know, obviously for the cheapest cost, you can literally set up your pool, all low priority. And, you know, if anything gets preempted, you have a reduction in capacity, your job will take a little longer. If you need effectively a guaranteed finish in a certain time, you can set up a baseline of dedicated VMs. That's always there. And even if all your low priority gets taken away, there's still that baseline there. But you're still getting your work done uh, cheaper. Uh, you could run your same production work workload on capacity as dedicated and then supplement it. And then the vast majority of the time, your work will actually finish faster and, and cheaper. And again, even if it goes away, you've got that same through production throughput that you previously had. And then finally, you can use the scaling to basically fill in the troughs. So if uh, VMs get preempted and you lose some, you can dynamically scale up the full price dedicated VMs. And then when we auto recover the low priority VMs, you can scale back down. So you're only paying for the full price VMs effectively to fill in the trough. So this is a real world example. This is a snippet of our auto scale formula. Uh, we want the, our pool to stay as close as possible to 500. And that's what we set the target low priority to be. And then we set the target so, yeah, target low priority, and then we set target dedicated to be an average of the number of preempted nodes. So this is a real run I did on a, a production, and you can see we get to 500, and then there's some preemption happens. So the available node, low priority nodes drops. But then in the black, what you can see is the auto scale formula kicking in and spinning up the full price dedicated VMs. So then the net of that is that the drop in capacity is much, much less because the dedicated is spin up. And then effectively, it overshoots a little, effectively filling in the gap. So my guess is in this case, the aggregate capacity would have basically been about the same. But you've only paid, you've mainly paid just for the low priority VMs and only used a tiny amount of the full price dedicated VMs. So all this is possible with uh, the batch and what batch sort of provides on top of this offering and with the auto scale formula. So I know I'm. Five minutes over, sorry, Karan, but uh, I'm going to hand over to Karan now, and I'm going to get a whole lot of grief for that. No, um, no, it's okay. Hand over Karan to, for the rendering. <laughs> right, thanks, Mark. All right, I'll switch it over. You got it. There you go. Thank you. All right, so who was, uh, who was at uh, Corey's session yesterday at, the, uh, at 5 p.m.? Hands up. Oh, cool. OK, so this is fairly new for, then, uh, for some of the folks down there. So um, yesterday, um, we announced um, uh, sort of a higher set of capabilities on top of what, um, what Mark sort of talked about earlier. Um, and we're really trying to be sort of industry vertical specific to try and make it easier for customers to integrate quicker. 
Um, and so we announced the new Azure Batch rendering platform, which is essentially that base where we're going to be able to take different types of ISV software and sort of provide them uh, in a much more integrated way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a video, and then I'm going to get TJ from Autodesk to come up and talk a little bit more about the challenges of customers today, what they're doing today, and how, you know, how the uh, rendering platform is going to actually solve it. All right, TJ, take it away. Cool, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm from Autodesk, obviously, and we're super lucky. We uh, we work with uh, thank you. We work with the people who do the biggest blockbuster films, your favorite television shows, the biggest games. Literally, you can pick whatever you're a fan of, and, and there's a very good chance that they're using our tools, which is really uh, really awesome for me because I get to go and visit all these different people. So I'm all over the place, which is really cool. Uh, but what we want to talk today about was about rendering, right? So what is rendering? It's really uh, the interesting thing is whether you're working on a film or, or a television show, you basically will be doing this. And this is the process of creating a 3D model or an animation or effect into an image, right? And so all of our customers, literally what you just saw, do this frame by frame by frame, right? They render an image every single frame. And so we got this really cool, amazing diagram for you. Uh, we didn't want to get too complex here, and we could dive into the weeds. But essentially, what, when we render something and make an image, first we calculate what the objects are in a scene, such as your orange ball. And then we send a, a bunch of rays out of the camera to figure out what, where they bounce, what they hit, what the light's seeing, and eventually it ends up per ray saying that it's this particular color. And so we do a bunch of these things. And as you can imagine, that's pretty computationally uh, intensive, all to get a beautiful, was it a peach color you picked there? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, but our, the big challenge for us, for our customers, is that we keep asking for more stuff, right? So the, anyone get to see Guardians of the Galaxy is a good example. Opening weekend last weekend is a pretty cool show, right? And you're watching this movie, and it's so you know, the effects are just amazing, but it's like literally there's a flying raccoon with a jet pack and he's whipping around and, and your brain doesn't even for a second say, wait a second, but raccoons can't talk because it's getting that real, right? And so this is what our customers are doing. And so what we see is um, two big challenges. And the first one is, this is kind of the, the typical artist workflow. As you can see, even trying to simplify it is it's very complex. I mean, even, you know, Tom talked about DAG and graphs and stuff, and that's all under the hood happening directly in our software in Maya, for instance, where we literally calculate what the model looks like and stuff. And so the artists will build the models, they'll do all the work, and then they'll render it. 
and then they'll realize that they want to change something. So they have to do it all over again, right? And the big challenge for us is that the render times are going up and up and up because we keep asking for more, right? So it's not a couple seconds. It can be a couple minutes or it can be hours and sometimes even days to see these renders per frame, right? And so challenge number one is we can't really allow the artist to do a lot of iterations without, as you can guess, scaling up the compute power behind them, right? So a typical rendering project, literally talking about millions of core hours going on, right? So um, I guess the good context is this, right? Where we'll see spikes of over 20,000 cores. You know, some of our customers have over 50,000 cores, for example, in one render farm just to generate images for us to watch. And those things are going really crazy, and they don't just spike and go down because they're extremely, um, well, essentially, they're high utilization, right? They're extremely computationally heavy, and, and they sit up there the entire time. So it's not like you know, one core just turn off and turn on. It's just going like crazy. And so the big challenge our customers are seeing are two things. One, a lot of, a lot of us asking for more stuff, and two, they want to do a lot of iterations, but they're getting more and more limited. And so what's really cool about what we're talking about today is that this is a nice solution for that, right? So whether you're a startup, you don't have the million dollar render farm, and you just want to use some computers, now you can, right? Or if you are a giant company that already has this, but you still have a spike to hit a deadline, now you can just spool up and away you go, right? So rather than go through that in a lot of detail, because you know we're all excited about PowerPoint, three in the afternoon, right? thought we would jump into some uh, cool Yeah, so, so um, you know, essentially there's all these challenges that sort of TJ talked about in terms of projects that people are doing. Um, and so you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about how Azure Batch can help. Um, obviously, there's sort of the, the generic sort of scheduling side of things. But really, um, you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing is going to be ISV licensing. So um, we're going to solve that challenge in, in this new platform. So there's going to be a single bill for Autodesk products, and then obviously future down the line, um, other, um, other components as well. So essentially, you're just going to be able to submit a job, get a single bill back for your compute, and on top of that, um, the software licensing as well. So there's going to be no you know, heavyweight you know, license service to set up, um, nothing to configure, no VNets. Um, you're just going to be able to go ahead, submit your jobs, um, and forget about the licensing part. Um, the second thing really is going to be ease of deployment and flexibility. Um, Batch really is supposed to be this open platform where you're able to go and dig in, really, um, uh, you know, really sort of diagnose your stuff, um, and really have complete control of your entire pipeline. Um, and you know, we're going to enable that with different parts of the components. So we're going to have a Python-based API um, and other, other uh, libraries as well, but essentially a Python-based API, which will be rendering specific so that you can integrate it into your pipeline um, automatically. Um, additionally, we're going to have sort of high-level tools that we're going to make open source, um, you know, plugs into different types of applications. Uh, some of those I'll sort of talk about as well. Um, familiar tools. Um, so, you know, we are going to try and make tool sets for um, all of the familiar stuff uh, that the artists are using today. Um, you know, whether it's Maya, Max, uh, or other components, um, you know, we're going to be making higher level based um, uh, tool sets so that artists or high level people that don't actually have any idea what Azure is are just going to be able to go in, install their stuff, put in their credentials, and they're good to go. Um, so, this is really going to help people move sort of forward uh, and transition into the cloud. Um, the other cool thing is uh, state-of-the-art infrastructure. So, um, you know, you can sort of, you know, Mark sort of talked about, you know, spinning up pools of different sizes of VMs. Uh, the cool thing is you can have different types of pools for different types of purposes. So you could have a pool which is commodity hardware, you know, one cores, two cores, um, and you're just doing some tests, low-resolution testing. Uh, but then once you're actually ready to your production workload, you can have a separate pool of machines uh, that are potentially really high-end, um, you know, 16 core or 24 core machines, and then even things like GPU machines in the future as well. Um, and that's all with a flip of a switch that you can just say, hey, I want to run this on this pool or that pool or these machines or that machines. Um, and then you can scale up based on whatever you need. So that's going to be really, really cool. And we're going to expose all of this feature set into the other tool sets as well. Um, this is an obvious one, uh, but I like to put it in all the time because people still come up to me and say, 
You do Linux? Yes, we, we absolutely do Linux. Um, uh, you know, there's some, some interesting talks out there that talk about you know, how many number of VMs are running on, on Azure, and it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting to see that change. So um, uh, obviously, yes, we will have Linux and Windows images, and in the future, you'll able, even be able to bring in things like containers. We'll have container support down the line, so if you wanted to uh, publish your, uh, your, uh, you know, your binaries or anything like that, you can, you can do that directly. Um, anywhere, anytime. So most, most companies today that are doing rendering have distributed teams, um, and because this is software, it can be deployed to all of our data centers. So what that means is every time we have a new set of uh, feature sets, it's available everywhere. Um, you, know, you, can, you can have multiple different sets of um, environments set up in multiple locations, um, everyone doing sort of rendering directly into the cloud. Um, so that's gonna be obviously great. Um, and then the last thing is um, you know, security. Um, that's definitely a challenge in this sort of industry. Uh, we've done a lot of work on the compliance and security side uh, to make this very viable. So um, you, know, uh, you can sort of go read up about some of the MPAA certifications that we've been uh, working on um, and some of the other uh, uh, certifications that are, uh, that are included as part of Azure. Um, and so there's a security center on azure.com. Um, and so you know, we're definitely sort of uh, talking about that as well. So how, how, how is this all, the, all this stuff really going to look uh, from a perspective of uh, you know, how, does, how does somebody interact with the service? Or how does somebody interact with this, uh, 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 you know, this set of tool sets? So what we're going to have is, um, you know, obviously, you have the client application. We're designing all of your, all of your assets, um, AKA your digital models, your 3D models. Uh, you're lighting your stuff. You're rendering your things um, locally. Um, and then we'll essentially have a uh, direct plugin into those applications um, that expose APIs of Azure directly into those client plugins. So you'll be able to sort of control things like pools. You'll be able to control uh, different types of uh, parameters. Uh, and then just seamlessly submit your job uh, and we will take care of the rest. Now that's for somebody that doesn't actually know Azure, but obviously underneath the covers, you can obviously use the, 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 the APIs directly to integrate it in. Um, so, so, the, so the workflow is that you know, the plugins and all of that sort of stuff will take care of your upload into, into blob storage, um, and then in the future maybe even cluster, storage, uh, cluster file systems, um, which submits the job, it goes ahead, spins up the VMs, we will be responsible, meaning Azure Batch will be responsible for actually provisioning the VMs that include these binaries like um, you know, Arnold or, or whatever else, um, and then we will run those tasks as part of the job uh, on a pool and then essentially give you monitoring, reporting, billing uh, through various different tools, either by integrated into the plugin or even directly into the Azure portal as well. Um, so I, I, I want to get maybe TJ to talk a little bit about the three different products that we're going to offer uh, starting off. Yeah, and we'll jump into a demo in a second, but it's, it's really cool to see that, you know, obviously uh, Maya was our first Academy Award winning software. It's a 3D software, right? And we've got 3ds Max, and those two software you're building, your models, your animations, your effects. And then just recently, we're uh, Solid Angle and Arnold has joined the family, so that's, and they literally just won an Oscar this year too. So another Academy Award winning uh, product, in this case it's a renderer, uh, and so we'll jump into the tool and we'll show you what it looks like. Perfect. Oh, still in presenter mode. All right, so here we have um, essentially the Azure portal here. Um, and what you're able to see is the experience is pretty similar to what Mark showed off in terms of um, what the batch accounts look like. Um, essentially, it exposes an API and an endpoint. Um, and so once we have the actual um, batch account, uh, we obviously sort of see the similar type of experience, or exactly the same experience, uh, which is uh, I have a different set of pools running over here uh, that I can click into. Now, the addition that we will do here, the next time you'll be able to create a pool, will essentially expose a bunch of different things. So here, what I'm going to be able to do is I'm actually going to be able to select a pre-existing uh, pre image, which is a graphics and rendering image. And we will essentially be responsible for keeping a track and managing these images. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, in the future, you can sort of deploy your Docker images as well. Um, and then obviously, the publisher here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and select either Linux or Windows. Uh, let me go ahead and pick Windows here. And then obviously, I can select the MySQ. And then obviously, future down the line, we'll have others as well. 
Um, and then the cool thing here is I can then directly go in and actually even look at the different types of applications that I want to deploy as part of this uh, pool. So that once you deploy the pool, it's all pre-configured, pre ready to go. All you need to do is hit the button, and then your jobs are running. So I can click whatever I need to click. Um, you know, for example, if I need to select Maya and Arnold or a combination of those, I can certainly do that and then go ahead and deploy it. Now, I've already got a pool running here, so let me go directly into that. So I'm going to go into the pool that I've got a couple of machines running over here. Um, and obviously, they're all idle. Um, and I'm going to go into a application, uh, which is Maya. So here, I've got a model. Whoop, doesn't seem like it's up here. Here we go. Actually, let me try and maybe. Uh, Let me try and duplicate my, um, my screen. There we go, much better. So, so here we've got um, the, uh, the Maya application running on my laptop. Um, and then obviously, I've got a, a very simple model here, uh, which I can sort of interact with and, and, and play around with. Um, now, traditionally, what will happen is somebody will go ahead and render this thing, um, and then they will just sit around for about a couple of hours before uh, you know, they get a, a, a render back. And so, what I actually want to do is, um, I actually want to click this thing here called the Azure Batch Maya Client. Um, and what this does is this directly integrates into Maya, and what you have is configuration settings. And so over there, we have service, logging, batch account keys, storage account keys. This is traditional Azure stuff that all you need to do is go into the portal, copy and paste all your credentials, and then essentially it will automatically authenticate against the batch service and be ready to go. Um, here you've got the submission tool. Um, we've got the pool management here. Obviously, all of this stuff is open source. So you can absolutely go in, change stuff around, white label it yourself, and even expose additional uh, functionality if you need to. So I can auto-provision a pool for this job. What that means is if I want to actually tie a job directly, uh, tightly coupled to a pool, meaning I spin up the pool, I run my job, and I sh uh, shut it down so that I only pay for what I use, you can absolutely do that. Or, um, as sort of Mark mentioned, you know, we can have a pool up and running already so that I can just keep firing jobs at it so that I can get the best utilization out of it. So I'll go ahead and click uh, Reuse Existing Persistent Pool. I've got a couple of theirs. I've got a couple of pools going already, so I'm going to pick one. Um, uh, you see here the render actually automatically picks up as being Arnold. Um, and so that's, that's the actual render that's going to be um, you know, in the VM. Additionally, Maya will be in the VM as well since we're rendering through Maya. Um, I can obviously pick my start frame, end frame, so I can go, say, 100 here. Um, I can even watch this job. So what this means is um, I can go ahead, watch this job. It's going to pop up a command line, um, and it's going to actually monitor the job for me and download the outputs as they complete. Um, and additionally, um, uh, you, know, you can sort of close off Maya and then keep that running as well. Uh, we've done some work uh, to do some asset management as well. So what this means is you know, traditional projects can have hundreds and thousands of files. And so it becomes very hard to maintain that sort of challenge where you want to keep that stuff in sync in the cloud. And so what we've actually done is we make sure that you upload all your assets before you actually go ahead and submit a job. Um, so obviously, and then again, I can add, add arbitrary files and folders as well. Uh, we've got a couple of pool management things here. So for example, well, it's, it's important yep. to note that, like you said earlier, uh, yep. it's smart enough to know that once you've uploaded, if I'm uploading the same stuff, it won't bother. Right? It's, it's quite intelligent about actually you know, making sure that you're doing the optimal amount here. And what's really cool with this framework, as you can see, is like it's very artist friendly. Anyone that's familiar with Maya would be able to be very comfortable just jumping in and clicking buttons. But under the hood, it is all open and scriptable, right? So if you do have a more technical artist or an engineer on staff, they can get in there and really tune it exactly to what they want. So from a studio perspective, this is great because you can actually make a push of a button or you can get in there and actually tune the Ferrari the way you want it. Absolutely, absolutely. So we try to sort of make this, um, obviously, there's some you know, pool management here as well um, that you can look at. So again, depending on how your sort of organizational chart works, you can decide to expose this or not decide to expose this as well. Um, there's some really sort of uh, uh, low level sort of resizing here. So I can resize my pools directly from the plugin as well. Um, and then we do have some job monitoring um, as well. So for example, uh, there's a previous job that I've already submitted here um, uh, that I can look at. And then I can even look at things like thumbnails. Um, I, can do, um, I can do additional things uh, like go directly to the portal and the job over here as well. 
Um, and then the last, the last thing there is the, the, the environment. So because I have the ability to launch these pools directly from the client, um, I also have the ability to select the same sections that I did in the, uh, in the portal, but on the plugin side as well. So that makes it really seamless for an artist to do so. Um, and then again, additionally, there's a couple of other uh, feature sets there for, uh, for the artists. Now, uh, you know, just want to make this completely clear. This is all open source. Um, so actually, we've actually got the portal here. Um, Azure Batch for Maya, it's, it's public today, so you can go check it out. Um, it, it, it installs all the dependencies directly, automatically. Uh, you can go ahead and look at the code. You know, we recommend you go check it out, make changes to it, suggest those features um, uh, so that we can improve it over time. So um, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and submit a job. And so what this is going to do, oh, I haven't saved my scene file. So let me save that. See, it's dummy proof, really. Right? And so that's going to go ahead and uh, make sure that the output files are already now Again, I've already been submitting this job previously, so it is going to go check into blob storage to make sure the files are already there and we're not submitting it all over again. So it's going to go ahead and upload those files and the ones that have been made changes to, uh, and it will go ahead and submit that job so that we can then go back and look at the jobs. So here we have a list of jobs that are already there. Um, you, know, you can obviously see the state um, uh, display name. This is Again, the exact same experience that Batch already offers, um, uh, so that it's very familiar to people that are already even using Batch uh, for other purposes as well. So well, there we go. So the job completed successfully. And I actually kicked off the watch the job. So it's going to go ahead and make sure that it monitors the job and downloads all the outputs uh, and, and even exposes all of the errors. If there's any errors or you know, textures are missing or files are missing, it's going to make sure that it's going to give you that uh, level of feedback. Um, and then the final thing is, if things really go disastrously bad, you can obviously go into the VM and look at the VM itself and make sure um, that you can look at the logs or the stack trace um, or check out to make sure that your files are there so you're rendering properly. Um, so there we go, running 0%. Um, I can look at the job here. So let me go ahead and refresh that. There we go, that job popped up there. So now it says the status uh, is going to be active. Progress is zero because it's rendering 100, 100 tasks. Now, Batch gives us the capability to actually run multiple tasks on a single VM. So these are all things that are configurable. Um, right now, in this case, it's 100 tasks, one task per VM, or one frame per VM, essentially. Um, so I've actually already got, uh, you know, in the interest of time, actually, let me go back and see if the pool is being utilized now. So here we go. So you can see the pool is all green. Uh, what that means is all the tasks are running, all the images are being rendered. Uh, and then so let's go ahead and see what the output looks like. Um, this is a really simple example, but it kind of gives you a really good idea of what is possible with this kind of stuff. Um, so it really you know, puts the power in the hands of the 10-man band armies that are now able to compete with guys like Disney, Pixar's of the world. Um, so it's really enabling those people to really take advantage of the cloud very quickly. So um, yeah, so these, these are all frames that I'm just kind of looking at um, uh, that have been pre-downloaded. So um, again, you know, we would, uh, uh, right now, the, the actual service is in preview. Um, so what that means is if you create a batch account, uh, we would need to whitelist you. So please go ahead and we'll, we'll pop up a sign up page uh, at the end so that you can sign up. Um, let's go back. So hopefully that, that gives you a really good idea of, you know, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, what we're sort of trying to build on top of this. There's actually a lot of different feature sets uh, that we didn't, you know, have time to get into, but there's definitely much more feature sets to come, many more applications that we're going to be supporting there as well. Uh, and again, all you're doing is paying for exactly what you need. So you can go into the plugin, launch a job, it's going to go ahead, run your job, and all you're paying for is your compute resources and your software. Um, there's obviously no additional charge for, uh, for using Batch as well. So I wanted to share a couple of uh, different um, you know, customer stories. Uh, these guys have actually been rendering uh, stuff on Azure using Batch, uh, and they're now on the platform. Uh, so Jellyfish Pictures is actually a um, studio in UK. Um, they've got a couple of different spots um, elsewhere as well. Um, and they actually worked on different uh, rendering projects um, over the years um, and, uh, and have been sort of rendering and using, using the service. Uh, so this is just some of the shots that they've been working on. 
Now, I wanted to make sure that you know, the same tool set is also being used by other industries as well, not just media entertainment. Now, it's synonymous with media, but you know, we have customers such as Oceaneering. This is a subsea surface engineering company that is today using 3ds Max and V-Ray to render things like um, you know, oil rigs, uh, or they actually even build things like uh, submarines that actually go in and repair and do maintenance on these oil rigs. So this is just some of the work that they're doing um, you know, on, uh, on the rendering platform. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you know, uh, the, the, the platform is really meant for people, um, uh, you know, although you can get started without writing code, um, you obviously need to have some, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, understanding of how Azure works. Um, and so we are working with service providers as well to make sure uh, that we en enable the whole ecosystem. You know, there's always going to be the, 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 the folks that are, uh, that are working on things like um, uh, uh, you know, just the, the code stuff. But we also want to make sure that we offer the whole service providers. So we are working uh, with Conductor. Um, we wanted to announce the fact that uh, Conductor is going to be available. The Conductor platform is going to be available in Azure uh, very shortly. Uh, so I would, I would really encourage you to check those guys out. Um, it's going to be a full end-to-end -end studio in the cloud-based offering for services. Um, and they will offer really amazing capabilities. Um, so if you wanted to do rendering in the cloud for VFX studios um, and other types of workloads for rendering, then you're going to be able to use Conductor directly on Azure. Um, it's going to work seamlessly. They're going to have a great portal experience. Um, and then uh, I, you know, to finish off, I wanted to show off a reel that they've uh, kindly uh, presented to us. Um, uh, to sort of get people excited. And so I'd really recommend you check these guys out um, later in the year. So um, these guys are going to be available in beta later this year on top of Azure. So really recommend that you guys uh, check these guys out as well. So the, the platform, as I mentioned, is in preview. Uh, please visit rendering.azure.com, um, our, our, our Azure Batch rendering website, um, to sign up into the preview. Uh, we're going to be accepti accepting nominations uh, starting today. Um, and uh, you know, we'd be happy to get you started uh, on the platform. So uh, I know we're a little bit over time, but happy to take any questions if there are any. Uh, otherwise, thank you.